Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 389. This program is dedicated in merit of Baruch ben Yomim ben Menuch Elena, Miriam Baschaya Sara Altes, Yukusil ben Leil Rochel and Rochel Bas Liba Farkash, and is dedicated by Pinchas Tadris ben Miriam and Sara Bas Rochel Altes. Tonight is Chavbe Shvat, the 34th yard site of the Rebbe Tzilchay Mushke, Chavbe Shvat Tovshim Memches, 1988. So we will definitely begin with speaking about that, as well as going forward in the relevance and lessons we learned from this week's Pasha Mishpatim, and some follow-up to uh, previous week's questions that were asked, questions continue to be asked, unfortunately and sadly, about some of the abuse and traumas and challenges in our communities, in all communities. And above all, we are here to take chesidus, take teira and chesidus and apply it to our personal lives, which is the ultimate of your futsu ma'inasecha chutza, living and breathing and um, applying chesidus in every aspect of, of our lives. The futsu ma'inasecha chutza means the spreading, the disseminating of Chassidus, Maya Nesechad, your wellsprings, the wellsprings of the Baal Shem Tov, and all those that followed him, all his Mamala Mekeme, all his, those successors, the Magid, the Magid, the Magid, the Alta Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, the Tzamech Tzedek, the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rashab, the Friedrich Rebbe, and our Rebbe of the seventh generation, nine generations of the Baal Shem Tov, and that, that will bring Mashiach. Osimar the Malka Mashiach, as Mashiach promised the Baal Shem Tov. So hopefully we are doing our part, at least part, at least to some extent, in taking chesidus, living with it. Okay. So as we said, we start with chov be shvat, chov be shvat. So the first obvious question is, what? How do we apply chesidus? How do we apply this day to our personal lives? So there are many different sikhs that Rebbe himself delivered about the Rebbe and connected to chov be shvat. And might as well cite the one that the last one, Tavshin and Beis, when the Rebbe spoke about the uh, Bechol Yevorech Yisrael, which is that Chav Beis is the word is the same letters of Bechol. Bechol is Chav Beis, the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which encompass Yevorech. All matters should be blessed through and with this day, as the Rebbe states in the Sicha that he delivered then which was then edited, beautiful, powerful sicha, definitely worth reading in honor of Chav Beis Shvat. But I'll just take one akud, the one point from there, that really I think can apply each one of us in our own way. And there he talks about the role of fulfilling the mission, the very mission of existence itself, which is to make a dira b'tachten, to a home for the divine in this world, in this material world. Now we know a home can be at many different levels. You can have a minimal home, a shelter, that protects you from the elements. You have a roof over your head. Yeah. But you can also have a beautiful home, a dira no. And the Talmud, the Gemara talks about uh, dira no is not just a cosmetic thing, it's actually marchiva daita shalodam. It expands the mind of the person. So it affects us internally. So God didn't just want to have a regular home, He wanted a beautiful home. And in that sense, the name Chayimushka, the two names of the Rebetzin, capture, personify the very essence of making a dira no. The role of the male building a home is zochr nekeva bara esim, you need male and female, husband and wife, soulmates. The role of the male is to build a, no, is to build a home, to tame the elements, to create an a environment that's safe. But the role of the woman, particularly, specifically, is to build a beautiful home. And chaya means life and vitality, a home full of life, a dynamic home, a, a, full of energy, full of chayas. And mushka is from the word a beautiful scent, a perfume, mushak, musket, a perfume, which creates the, the vibe, the environment. So both these names signify the additional element, being that the Rebbeson was the Rebbeson, the Rebbe is the Rebbe, that lesson to each one of us in our own homes, in our own environments, especially to women, 
the role that they play. Now, this doesn't mean that it's exclusive. Obviously, both have to do both. The men have to also help and contribute to the beautiful home, as well as the woman building the very essence of what a home is, which is just the bear, even the shelter, even the protection. But nevertheless, each has their particularly unique role. This is a critical message, even though it sounds simple, but especially in our day and age, where there's so much questions about gender and identity, and what is the role of a male, what is the role of a female, there's a big crisis going on. And I don't just mean the gender crisis. I mean, in general, what is a human identity? Why are we here and who are we? And what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Obviously, there's more in common. We're all human beings. We're all created in the divine image. But the specific role that each of us plays, that this sikha captures it, among many others. But here, it's really very, very succinct and powerful in telling us what is each one of our roles. If we were able to set our minds, and this is the applied element, and say, here is my mission in life. What am I doing in this hostile world, in this corrupt world of building a home, not just a physical home for my family, but even at work, and even when you're in the street and whenever you meet, that you somewhat tame the elements, somewhat you're sublimating the world, not to just be a selfish entity focused on its own needs, but somewhere increasing goodness and kindness, light, giving instead of just taking. That is called building a home. Building a home for the divine. Building v'shachanti b'secha. That a place where God says, I rest, I, rest, I dwell. B'secha, inside of you. So it all begins within each one of us. And then there's the second aspect. Not just to do it, but also to do it in a beautiful manner, in a gentle way, in a majestic way, in a dignified way. When someone feels that energy, they want to be part of such an experience. So it's two components. One is in general building that home, which is already beautiful. But then that itself can be done in a very beautiful, in a more beautiful way, in a nurturing way. This is what we need because at the end of the day, existence, all of our existence, everything about us is about taking a world that on the surface can seem so hostile, divisive, and turning it into a loving place. And love is about attachment. Love is about connection. Love is about bonding. It's about bringing unity into a diverse and even divisive world. That's what it's about. Harmony within diversity. That's why Ava and Echot are the same gematria. Ava and Echot, which is what? 13. Echad is Aleph, Ches, Dalet. That's 1, 8 is 9, and 4 is 13. Ava, 1, 5 is 6. And the base is, is 8. And then the last, He is 5, is 13. 13. 13, the symbol of unity, of connection, of bonding. So it's not a 1, just not just a number 1. It's not just a number 2. It's taking the diversity of all of existence and turning it into one dry, dry, synchronicity, one harmony. And that is what our, our role is. That's why it's called Dira B'Tachtainim. One home in Tachtainim in a multitude. Now the multitude is part of the process. All beauty, we know beauty, Teferis, means more than one color, more than one musical note. But it's the combination in a harmonic way. And that's what creates the Dira No and the beauty. So one of the points taken from the Rebetzin's name, and the name of course signifies the very soul of the person, Chayim Mushkin. Of course, there are many, many other lessons, and let me read a few questions that came in about this. What changes and new things did the Rebbe Institute after Chav Bei Shvat? So more detail. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, did you notice that after the Rebbe's passing on the 22nd of Shvat, which was, as I said, 1988, the Rebbe turned up the fire and started doing so much more work than he did before, more sikhs, more teachings, more dollars, etc., would you be able to give a quick summary of some of the things the Rebbe did and instituted after 22nd of Shvat? Thank you. I would rephrase it a bit because the Rebbe was turning up the fire all the time. And I don't know if after Tav Shemem Ches you can say that it was more, more initiatives than before. And I don't want to even compare the two. What you could say, we turned up the fire regarding Mashiach, that was for sure. We saw the intensity, the sense of urgency. But there were also, so more sikhs, more teachings? Well, 
I don't, who, who measures? We're talking about quantity, quality. In quantity, is actually was less. Less fabrengens, meaning shorter fabrengens, I should say. And uh, l- l- lesser of the long fabrengens. There were more shorter sikhs. Overall, however, there were probably more sikhs in the year. There were definitely more. And maybe the sum total, I never really measured it. But regardless, I don't want to get nitpicky about the numbers here exactly. My point is that I think the real emphasis has to be the real shifts that you saw. And we still don't understand exactly what all the shifts were. It was clearly a significant watershed moment where, not right away, but within the months that followed Chav Beishvat, there were significant changes. Besides the fact that the Rebbe moved his whole operation for a year to the house on President Street. Besides for the fact, of course, the Rebbe davening three times a day. The emphasis in Nachayit and Alibay, every Fabrengen, that the living shall take to heart, the lessons we learn from the Rebbe, from the whole experience. We saw the Rebbe was living, a, it was definitely a shift in his whole being and consciousness as much as a human being can identify. Besides that, there were actually real changes, which was the most uh, startling, uh, startling element to it, and that is the Rebbe stopped saying my marim by the summer of 88. A little earlier than that, it stopped the explanation of Rashi Sichas, which went on from the time he began in Tavshin Chafei. So we're talking about the 23 years, Tavshin Chafei, Lamed Hei, Mem Hei, 23 years of every Shabbos explaining a Rashi Sicha, which he started after the passing of his mother. The explanations of the Zoyar and the explanations of his father's notes on the Zoyar stopped. Explanation of Pirkei Yovis in the summer months, after Pesach in summer months. The explanation of the Rambam. Things that Rebbe himself instituted, all that stopped. The Maimorim was maybe the most, because the Maimorim is what Rebbe says is a Maimorim. There were a few exceptions, but generally on a regular basis it stopped. Now, I'm not going to analyze why. All, all we know is that it was definitely connected to Chav Beishvat because it followed that. But should anyone even doubt the question, I don't even want to bring it up, but I'll say it. Chaz V'Shalom, Rechmon al to say there was any weakness or any change or shift in the Rabbeistve. The Rebbe Zareb. The Rebbe Zareb, that never changes and Etzem never changes. The form of expression changed. And I should have also mentioned Fabrengens became much shorter. When a Fabrengen used to go to 5.30, the latest, sometimes 6.30, sometimes a little earlier, now Fabrengens after basically, basically after Pesach that year, 1988, it began, Fabrengens began to shorten to 3.15, sometimes 3 o'clock, maybe even basically uh, an hour and a half or two hours max. Again, without going into explanation, these were some of the changes. The Rebbe, of course, instituted a few, just after Chav Beishvat, the next month is Chav Fei Oder, is the Rebbe's birthday. So that's when he formally instituted the Mifzi Yei Maledas, even though the Rebbe was already speaking about it before, but this became now in a full formal fashion. Mifzi Yei Maledas, there was, of course, uh, the establishment of Keren Chomish, Ken Chomish is the name Chaim Mushka Shneis and um, and uh, which the Rebbe established in her honor, as well as other things. The dollars began a little earlier before Memches, but of course continued, and that was one of the main ways the Rebbe communicated with people all the time. And Mashiach, Mashiach was the most pronounced increase. But even though in Tavshim Emzayin already, Purim Emzayin, the Rebbe already began to, you can say put up the fire on that matter as well, not just Mem Zayin, but in the years in the, mid, in the mid-Mems as well, mid-80s, but after Mem Ches, it really took on a whole different dimension. Beis Nisim Mem Ches is when the Rebbe said that with Shensuke puts the Kneplach, we already finished polishing the buttons, and it continued to accelerate from there on. The lesson to us is very clear. Melech a king and a queen, a Rebbe and a Rebbe. They are complete together. For some reason, when there was a hefzik in some, even a small moment, in the physicality of the Rebetzin's presence, that in some way affected the picture. But in order to only bring out even deeper resources within us to do the mission and finish the mission for which we were charged. And that mission is what the Rebbe already established in the beginning of his leadership in 1950-51 to bring the Geula, the Shechanti Besechom, Dira Betachtenim, as I discussed before, the seventh generation which will draw down the Shekhinah down to this earth. Okay. Is it significant or is it co- just a coincidence that the Rebbe and Rebetzin had the same first names as the Tzemach Tzedek and his Rebetzin? There are no coincidences. 
the name Yes Menachem Mendel, and the name Chaim Mushke, both the Rebetzin, and the Rebbe and the Rebetzin, and the Rebbe and Rebetzin's common ancestor, <laughs> the Tzemach Tzedek. Rebbe was a Ben Acher Ben from the Tzemach Tzedek, a direct descendant. Though, and the Rebetzin, of course, through the Friedrich Rebbe. So I don't think it's a coincidence at all. There are many similarities between the two, and including maybe a sadder one, which is they were the two, they were the only two Rabbeim that the Rebbe survived the Rebetzin, and all other Rabbeim that Rebetzin survived the Rebbe, if you can use that expression. But that, that, I don't know if that's a, what we can learn from that, but we could learn that there were similarities, and that Semach Tzedek also in some way many shifts happened after the Rebetzin passed away. And it was also five years. The Rebetzin Chaim Mushka of the Semach Tzedek passed away in Tafresh Chof Aleph, Semach Tzedek in Tafresh Chavah, five years later. Here's Mem Ches, and we're talking about um, Nun, uh, Nun Dalid, a little more than five years, but a similar amount of time. And, um, and but as far as the positive, positive side, the Rebbe has spoken about the names. I mentioned Chaim Mushka. There's also the name, the Rebbe's name, which is connected also to Mashiach, and other different symbolisms. So I would say there is a connection, and the Rebbe you saw has a particular connection to the Tzemach Tzedek. I personally was one of the people on the staff of Sefer Lekutim of the Tzemach Tzedek, which the Rebbe instituted. And in general, you see similarities in the Rebbe's style to the Tzemach Tzedek style of bringing together part of the Shebet Tere, Pshat Remez Drusad, of all the different methods of Tere teaching, the literal, the allegorical, the homiletic, and the mystical. So bringing and integrating all of that was very much a Rebbe, hallmark of the Rebbe's teachings, similar to the Tzemach Tzedek. And now Das, the Tzemach Tzedek is Das, the Alta Rebbe Chochme, the Mitle Rebbe Bina, the Alta Tzemach Tzedek Das, and the Rebbe is Malchus, Kava and So you have a certain connection between Keser, Das, Tiferes, um, Yisod, and Malchus. So there you have one more connection. But of course, each in their own generation doing the Aveda that they have to do, and the Rebbe being the, f- the final step of Malchus, drawing down all the Chsidis and all the Tera and all the godliness into Biyah, into the lower worlds, of bringing the Dira B'tachtenim to fruition in the Geula. What is the Rebetzin most famous for? Besides her being the Rebbe's wife. Well, she was extremely private, that we know. She was extremely edel, that we also know, very refined, those that met her, those that see some of the videos. And, and honestly, I, I, you know, the first thing that comes to me is the letter of the Friedrich Rebbe to the Rebbe that was published in later years about how he, whether he appreciates the treasure that he has. And the Friedrich Rebbe, in a very, like a riddle form, in three different letters over a period of, of eight months, I believe, writes to the Rebbe whether he appreciates the treasure. And the Rebbe writes back to the Fidik Rebbe, a, 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 a purportedly not, not understanding what treasure he's referring to. And finally, the Fidik Rebbe writes to the Rebbe on the birthday of the Rebbe, I think in Tofresh Tzadi Gimel, that the treasure I mean is no, none less, none, no one else, none else but your dear Rebbe, your wife. So as soon as you hear that, the treasure, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to go be able to identify what exactly that is, but there's no question that besides just being the Rebbe's wife, Friedrich Rebbe's daughter, uh, uh, a woman who was a granddaughter of the Rebbe Rashab, and you don't come on going all the way to the Alta Rebbe and beyond, had to have unbelievable qualities. We know the Rebbe said that she's capable of giving blessings, and the Rebbe spoke about her in ways by dollars when people spoke about her qualities. He said, you're, that's, you're, that's, that's, uh, that's not even touching the surface. It's far more than you can even imagine. So we know the, the, these expressions, but specifics, I would focus on primarily her Nusiris Nefesh of really being able to be quiet and private, but being there as a bulwark, as a partner to the Rebbe, which was, had to require tremendous Nusiris Nefesh. Besides the Rebbe giving his life, taking his private life away and becoming a Rebbe, the Rebbe in many ways also paid a heavy price. Maybe it was less noticed, so I think that is itself a tribute that it's hard to even describe because it's in silence. It's not so much, it wasn't so blatant. But it tells you about the character of a person. It tells you about the commitment, the dedication that, um, that sometimes you don't see. It's like the foundation of a building. You don't see it. 
It's not that. It doesn't have fireworks. There's no sizzle. But there's the real steak. I don't even know if that's the right word to use here. But you get the idea. It's the real foundational elements that stand as the foundations that last forever. And after Memches, we saw it more obvious as the Rebbe grieved and mourned over his partner, his sole partner in life. So that's a few things I would say about that. Okay. Um, so here's another interesting question that someone wrote. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, through divine providence, uh, or provenance, I was fortunate enough to find your path, path, path Actually, no, I'm reading the wrong question, my friends. Sorry. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, a close relative of mine once went out of their way to do a series of personal favors to the Rebbe and the Rebbetson close to 35 years ago. Okay? I don't want to elaborate exactly what the favors were. Because I want to remain anonymous, as your form allows us to write questions privately. Yeah, correct. After my close relative finished the series of favors, the Rebbe replied, I am forever indebted to you for what you did to help the Rebbe. Last Pesach, my mother was stricken with a severe terminal illness. I've been to the oil many, many times since Pesach, asking for a bracha for a full shlema, complete healing for my mother. Unfortunately, over the last few months, it appears that my mother's condition is getting worse, and I'm still waiting to see revealed brachas. Blessings for her recovery. Whether the recovery comes via medical science or via miracles and wonders. Yesterday I went to the oil again, and in desperation I began my kvittel, the note you write to the Rebbe, by reminding the Rebbe of this favor from 35 years ago. And saying a good way he could repay my family would be to give a blessing and, be pers- and to personally ask God to, to intervene and heal my mother. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, to the Rebbe when I wrote this, but in hindsight, maybe I was. In your opinion, do you feel I should go back to the oil and apologize to the Rebbe, or can this just be written off as a chesidish chutzpah with good intentions? Chesidish nerve with good intentions. Thank you for your opinion on this matter, and most importantly, may anyone in the community that is ill be completely healed by command of Hashem. As we have been taught that the cure precedes the illness, may the cures... Be revealed, and may everyone see positive blessings with their physical eyes. Amen. My answer unequivocally, based on previous similar stories, is no. It's not a chutzpah. A Rebbe is a Rebbe. A Rebbe is capable of giving brachas. Even if in heaven there is some type of decree or some resistance, we know tzaddik gezer, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim, a tzaddik decrees and God fulfills. And, and God, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gezer, and God decrees tzaddik mevatl. A tzaddik could also abolish a decree from heaven. And it, I would even go further. Even if the Rebbe had not promised or said that, that I'm forever indebted to you, we also go to the Rebbe and ask him. And we don't give up. We keep davening and davening and davening. What the Rebbe does with it, he'll do what he has to do. So we don't stop and we always go. This is not called chutzpah. This is actually called a deepest kashrus. It's like crying to your father, to your mother, and it's coming from a sincere place. A child that cries can never be wrong. Obviously, you have to do all the efforts and ishtadlus possible, but the, the, the appeal, the beseeching, that's what we do. As Moshe beseeched God, as the concept of prayer is in the first place. You could say prayer is also chutzpah. How do you pray to God? God decreed something. You want someone not to be well? God forbid in the hospital. Why are you trying to intervene? But that's what Hashem said. I want you to be a partner with me. I don't want you to just accept everything I do. Yes, there's an element of accepting. After you pray, you did everything possible. Ultimately, you accept whatever God decides. But meanwhile, as long as you can, you keep trying. And God says, I want you to fight for the good. I want you to fight for health. In every possible way. Not just medically, but through prayers. Now, especially the Rebbe said, I'm forever indebted. Okay, some people would say, you know, it's a little nerve to go actually call, call. But you know what? When you're in pain, as I said, a child cries, you, you, pull, all, you pull all the stops. And if you have, to have, you have extra cards, by all means, use them. That's my response.
more important, most importantly, the Rebbe should already respond. Tarim yikrov ani ene, even before you cry out, respond, and your mother should have a complete full shlema. As you said, everybody else should also have one. We should finally march to the gula, and no more dealing with misery and pain and grief and, and, and illness and death and only good things and good b'sudas teva b'tev hanidev hanigla in a revealed way. Finally, well, two more questions regarding Chav Beishvat. Let me make sure I've covered, covered here. Is it appropriate to display the Rebetzin's picture? Many Haredi newspapers and magazines don't show photos of women, even when the women are appropriately and modestly dressed. They also Photoshop women out of group pictures because seeing a photo of a woman is inappropriate. But when we walk into the wedding hall in Beis Rivka Lefferts, there's a giant photo of the Rebetzin on the wall. How is this permissible? And I should add that many other places and booklets and, and publications. So actually, interestingly, the answer was given to us already by the Rebbe. Arov, a very chosh of a distinguished rabbi, wrote to the Rebbe. He saw a booklet printed after the Rebetzin's passing with a picture of her. And he quoted the Gemara that says, you shouldn't look at a, a woman's picture, which is the basis of what you're describing. And the Rebbe quotes, takes the same Gemara that he cites and turns it around with all the conditions the Gemara writes and explains how it's not a fitting here. First of all, that you don't see someone that you know. That it has to be someone that you know. Secondly, the full color and black and white. I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm happy to share the answer with anyone. And above all, the Rebbe writes that if it, if, there, because it can cause, God forbid, negative thoughts. But if it leads to Yiddish Shemayim and people making good resolutions because the Rebbe inspires them, then, there are, then it seems like it is appropriate. That's how the Rebbe responds to it. Now, this doesn't mean we have to, in every situation, publish women's pictures. That's not what the Rebbe is saying. He's talking specifically about the Rebbe, not Sotkonis, a Rebbe. And with the different conditions, as I said, that you can see in that answer. So there's the same Gemara, and the Rebbe directly responded to it. So based on that, that's why we have the pictures displayed. I have a personal connection with this because my father, in the Algemeiner, did publish a series of pictures of the Rebbe and following her passing. The Rebbe actually thanked him for that. But there you could argue, it's Algemeiner is not necessarily a, you could say, it's his own responsibility. It's not a Chabad newspaper. It's not an f- official representation of halacha. The Algemeiner doesn't, not everything in the Algemeiner was pure halacha. But nevertheless, because the idea is the pictures do inspire people and inspire people toward Yerushalayim. And that's the bottom line. So that's the response. If anybody wants this, just go to the forum on chassidusapply.com, send us your email address, be happy to send you the full response of the Rebbe on this subject. <coughs> Excuse me. And leading straight from that into the final question on this topic, at least for now, dear Rabbi Jacobson, what are some practical things we can do to honor the Rebbe on our yard site and cause Hashem to give her neshama and aliyah and I should add, and also bring Nachas to her and to the Rebbe, and ultimately lead us to the Geula. So the Rebbe himself gave us directives. I mentioned before, birthday is one thing that Rebbe associated with her. Birthday, she's born on the day of the birthday of the world, according to Rabbi Loza, the 25th of Adar. And in addition to that, like I spoke before about Dira Na, all the mitzvahs especially connected to women, which is Neir uh, Shabbos Kedush, Chala, Kashrus, and and Tarasa Mishpacha, the three cardinal mitzvahs. So anything we can do in that regard is direct in her honor. And I would also add, basically, I would learn the sikh of Chav Beishva, Tov Shinun Beis, and other sikhs that the Rebbe, the Rebbe also handed out that year, a kuntris with Sikhs about the Rebbe and about in general the role of women. So learning that on Chav Beishvat and seeing the directives that are given there and fulfilling them are some of the things we can do. I also think it's a good opportunity, especially for women. This weekend is also the Kinnus HaShluchis, the conference for Shluchis, the, the women ambassadors all over the world. 
that for women to focus on their partnership with their husbands in the shlichas that they have, as the Rebetzin did. Now the Rebetzin had her way, and her discreet way. In most cases, shlichas are far more prominent, so I'm not focusing on that aspect, but just the dedication, the commitment. Someone once asked the Rebetzin, when was the best time of your life? And she said, right now. Meaning in every moment, that's the best time. So this type of approaches really teach you a lot of things and just a general commitment to that role of fulfilling why you're here in this world, which the Rebetzin clearly did so beautifully and so elegantly and quietly. Okay. So let's move now to Parsha Mishpatim. A few questions on this Parsha. This Parsha really is a continuation. Be'ela HaMishpatim. As Rashi says, that a continuation from that which happened at Sinai. Sinai, we got the Ten Commandments, last week's Parsha. And it continues. Ela Mishpatim. Shatosim Lefnechem, that Moshe Rabbeinu presents. And it's like a Shulchanor. Tosim Lefnechem. Presents them like a, a, a set table. So these laws, even though most of them if not all of them, are logical laws, mishpatim, rational laws about litigation, about damages, about servants, about relationships with one another. That too comes from Sinai. Because you can think rational laws don't need uh, the divine uh, decree, the divine edict, the divine mandate. No, also come from that. Because mishpatim is connected. I remember once writing an article got a lot of attention, especially by some t- scientists who wrote to me at the time. I called the l- article, Is Logic Logical? Most people, you hear that statement, you start thinking, one second, this is a good question. What the f- makes logic logical? Once it's here, yes, it's logical. That's the laws of logic. But the axioms that define logic, why is logic logical? And in many ways, Mishpatim captures that idea that even the logic, even the rational mind, at the end of the day, comes from something that is beyond rational. Not irrational, super rational. And when you appreciate that, you really can appreciate what the mind, the mind can sometimes be overrated. Because the mind is not an end in itself. Yes, it's a powerful machine, a computer. It can analyze and evaluate and research and gather data and come to conclusions. But life is played out also in the world of emotions and feelings. What would we be like if we only had a mind without feelings? And sometimes we escape behind our minds at the expense of our feelings and our experiences. Life is an experience, and experience is far more than just a cerebral one. So as much as the mind does come to understand certain laws, it's always built on something that is beyond, something super-rational. And that gives it its solid foundation. Because remember, logic can also be, you can make your laws of logic and decide that logic dictates that certain people should be treated cruelly because they are vermin, as the Nazis, Yimach Shemam, or others did. So logic can also be as you see fit. Obviously, logic has its laws and rules. But still, we've seen how logic works. If you don't have, you're not answering to a higher power you're not answering to some higher absolute where logic, that logic is based upon, it can go in all kinds of very wrong directions and even destructive ones. So that's a general lesson from Mishpatim that we all need to keep in mind and have both elements. In the language of Chassidus, Chassidus applied, Chachma, which is the beginning of intellect, the first of the cognitive faculties, Ultimately, Chachma Chassidus explains Koyachma, the power of what? There's an element of Chachma that's not just about intellect. It's about recognizing a higher truth. That's more and more that I'm smart and I'm logical and I understand things. I am sublimating myself. I am surrendering, actually, to a higher truth. The true pursuit of wisdom and intelligence is not to be smart and know how to figure things out. It's to allow yourself to channel in a higher truth, a higher reality than your own. And that's what Chachma does. It's connected to Keser. So Chachma is Koyach Ma, Ma. Chachma Ma'ayin Timotze, as Chassidus explains, Ma'ayin. It comes from a level of Ayin, which is the opposite of Yesh. Yesh is me. Bina means I understand. Chachma means the idea is understood. Bina means you are grasping the idea. Chachma is 
the idea is grasping you. The higher truth, the higher reality is subsuming you into a higher state of consciousness. And that's the ultimate truth. And that's Mishpatim's connection to Sinai. And that's what this chapter captures. In that itself, let's talk about some specifics, a few questions that came in. Why did it take 40 days and 40 nights to receive the Torah? We know God is omnipotent and could have created the world in less than a second, but chose to do so, do it over a six-day period to teach us a lesson. In that vein, he could have given the Torah during the halftime show of the Super Bowl. A little irreverent, okay, but fine. But he chose to do it over a 40-day and 40-night period. So what is the lesson for us? Okay. I read sometimes the irreverent stuff. I just want to apologize for those that see it as somewhat inappropriate or sacrilegious. Because firstly, I find it in a way endearing. People feel comfortable to write this way. I feel it's like more natural, even though I wouldn't write such an expression. But people use their references. And secondly... I really want everybody to be comfortable to be able to ask questions and not feel judged. And even though I will make comments sometimes about an expression I would use differently, but it's not meant to invalidate anybody. It's just meant to higher the standard if we wish. But we all understand people use language in different manners. Just wanted to say that as an aside. It's also part of the lessons of Chassidus applied. So, great question. So why did God create the world in six days when he could have done it in a second? If you're a creator... You don't need six days. If you're not a creator, six days won't help. 6,000 years won't help. Because yes, it says in the Zoya, Sheishish Yomim Osas Hashem Es Hashemayim Vesa'aretz. Sheishish Yom, not Bih Sheishish. As the Zoya, it should have said during six days, in the period of six days. What means six days God created heaven and earth? Something's missing. So the Zoya says, because that's exactly what the, the, the verse is coming to tell us, that the six days are also the creation. God created six days. Six days God created. And, and, that, and, and what did he create then? Shemayim Varas, heaven and earth. Kol yema v'yema over davidte. He created the six days. In other words, he created a structure. The structure of the six, the six emotions, divine attributes of chesed, gvura, teferes, netzah, chayd, yisayid, malchus correspond to Sunday through Friday, then comes Shabbos, Malchus, the elevation of the worlds. So the same is true with the 40 days and 40 nights. Of course he could have taught in a second. But there's a purpose. So the first most obvious Balabatash answer is God, in creation, you could say there was no one around. God creates as he sees fit, but he wanted to create a structure. But here he's teaching Moshe Rabbeinu. And he wants Moshe Rabbeinu to retain the Torah. Could God have made a miracle and downloaded the whole Torah in him in a second? Of course he could have. But that's not the goal. That's why we're born and we learn Torah and we grow. Five, at five years old we learn Mikra, Becha Mishnah Mikra, Benesa Le Mishnah. Why is it not all downloaded to us? Which it actually is, by the way, in our mother's womb. But then we're made to forget, because consciously forget, because the goal is that we consciously should yigaita metzasi, should exert ourselves, make our effort, our initiative to gain Torah, then it's yours. The whole purpose of creation is that it should be internalized. And we see this elsewhere. The beginning of Vayikra, Rashi brings from Medrash, that Hashem stopped between Parsha and Parsha in order for Mesha to absorb. So you see it was done in a way that was commensurate. Even Mesha Rabbeinu is such a great man, but still he was a human being compared to God. So God paused so he should be able to absorb the Rebbe would say a sikha, then he would pause, they would sing a nigan, for an example. So the 40 days and 40 nights was meant to show the Torah is being given into a world that we should be able to incorporate it on our terms. Why specifically 40? There are different explanations, the 40 gates of bina, wisdom of, of uh, understanding. 40 is 4 times 10, the four worlds and the 10 spheres of each world. That's already different explanations of why 40. But the idea is essentially bringing Teda, Leba Shamayi, and he is not in heaven, but given to man on earth, to the human being, in time and space as we know it, on our terms. So it is Teda, but Yarda, Nosa, Yarda, as the Alter Rebbe says in chapter 4 in Tanya, it traveled downward until it became part of our understanding and the way we can integrate and internalize it. I mentioned chapter 4 in Tanya because. Just as a reminder, I'm also teaching how Tanya applied every 
Mitzray Shabbos every Saturday night, 10 to 10.30 p.m., which you can find again at chsidusapply.com or tanyaapply.com, more details. And I'm, I just finished chapter 5. What is the significance of, of, of us saying Nasa Nishma? Which means we will do and then we will say. Logically, it doesn't make sense to agree to do something before you know the details of what it is. So what would have been wrong if we instead said we will listen and we will, and we will do instead of we will do and we will listen? And to just magnify the question, the Talmud actually states, a Roman philosopher asked this question. What kind of rushed nation are you? You just sign a contract? I'm paraphrasing. Without even reading it? The other nations were shown the Tera, were, were offered the Tera, and then shown the Tera. They wanted to see what it says because you don't just sign a contract. You don't commit before you know what you're committing to. And also think about Jews. You know any Jew that just signs a contract without reviewing it? With a fine-tooth comb. So why suddenly here were they so like seemingly reckless? Seemingly. And the answer, my friends, is very simple. It wasn't because they weren't thinking. We're talking about a nation standing at Sinai. To use a modern lingo expression, they were dating God for seven generations already. Avram Avinu, their forefather, and Sarah, their foremother, the matriarch, and then Yitzchak and Rivka, and Yaakov and Sarah, Yaakov and Sarah, and, and, and I'm sorry, Yaakov and Leah and Rachel. And then the other generations, all the way to Moshe, seven generations. They suffer in the name of being children of Avram Yitzhak Yankov, of being not formally Jewish, but Jewish. So they knew who God was. It wasn't that they met God one day and God said, hey, here's a document, will you receive it? They just said, okay, yes, give it to us and then we'll do it. We'll do it, we will do and then we will listen. Or we will, un- we will do and then we will understand. They had an intimate and intense experience. At some point, you, you are, as they say today, some people have commitment issues. They didn't have commitment issues. They knew what God was. And they understood. Like the Medrash of Mechilta says, fascinating Medrash, that when the Jews came out of Egypt, they said to God, give us your mitzvahs, your gzeris, your decrees, your laws. And God said, first, first accept me, my sovereignty. Then I know that you'll accept my laws. So they had an experience with God, an intense experience. So then the day came, finally, the day that everybody was waiting for. No? The whole purpose of Israel, the 210 years of suffering, was to come to serve at this mountain. Now they finally come to the mountain. And even when they arrive at the mountain, they're already unified. Like one person, one heart. So they had no, no questions. They had no doubts. We know who, what we're getting into. We trust. There was trust. And once there's trust, everything else follows. I remember when speaking to a group of rabbis, and they asked me, it was like a training session, that, how do you communicate well? How do you get across your message? So I asked them a question in return. I said, if somebody comes to your synagogue or to your community, a group of people, you only have them for one half hour. You don't know if they'll ever return. What would you say to them in this half hour? What would be your goals? So one person said to inspire them. Another one said to them, try to get them to return. Another person tried to send, they should give a donation. They can pull that off in a half hour. Everyone had all kinds of interesting ideas. And no one, no one was, I would say, wrong. So I said, no, the most important thing in that half hour is to gain their trust. And not, not everyone, I remember, everyone had that expression on their face to gain their trust. Because once you have trust, everything else follows. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. So it's not about saying something brilliant or saying something that will blow, blow them away. Because then, yeah, you leave an impression. They may remember, they may not remember. The health, and the other things are going to happen in life. You build a trust. They say, you know, this person I can trust. So, of course, the follow-up question is, how do you build trust? You build trust when they identify with you. Don't just share a thought. Share an experience, a personal experience. So they say, ah, this person is like me. You may be greater than they are. You may be smarter than they are. But you're like me. You identify. You also cry. You also smile. You also have a family. Share something personal about your own journey. People identify with that. 
And that's what trust is built upon. Do people have absolute trust in a half hour? No, but you planted the seeds. Another thing, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Sheer empathy. I don't want to digress, but I wanted to point out, just to apply this idea, that once you know someone, then it's a different experience. Then Nasev and Nishma is natural. Because you don't want to keep going through mind, mind games and smoke screens and, and, and uh, avoiding and finding excuses. Yes, now we're ready. We're ready to marry you, God. That's what the Jews said. And we know and we trust. So we will do. And then we will we've accept. And then we will understand. And then we will listen. Okay. Dear Rabbi, why are most of the Ten Commandments said in the negative, as don't, like don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, don't desire what your friend has or covet. Would it not be a more positive approach to simply say, appreciate what you have, cherish your marriage, instead of saying, do not murder, cherish life, hold life precious? Okay, well, it's a good question. However, two things. First of all, when it comes to halacha, what halacha means, you need clarity. It's not just a matter of figure of speech. The famous explanation from the Rebbe, the Gemara says, I feel the The Torah doesn't even want to speak, say the word, impure animal, so it's An animal that's not pure, it doesn't say an impure animal. The Torah will add a word in order not to protect the dignity and the respect even of an animal, even of an impure animal. But when it comes to Allah, you suddenly see things are stated very black and white. And you'll say things that are very strong. The Torah will say, this is an abomination. It doesn't mince words. The answer is because when it comes to expressing yourself and describing, there you have to be in the most dignified and most subtle way. When it comes to Allah, people need a ruling. They can't, you can't leave for, room for ambiguity. This is kosher. This is not kosher. This is permitted. This is prohibited. So the first thing is that was why it had to be stated very clearly. If you say cherish life or appreciate what you have, people could say, okay, I do that, but you don't have an explicit prohibition of actually stealing from someone. Of course it's implied, but it's critical to say it that way. Another point maybe touches upon the machlekes between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva on this issue. When the Jews heard the, the positive commandments, so the Machlekes goes, Rabbi Shmuel says, when they heard al hain, hain, when they heard yes, they said yes. And al lav, lav, and what it said, don't do. They said, no, we won't do. Rabbi Akiva disagrees. On the yes, they said yes. And the lav, they also said yes. Now, there's no disagreement in Metzius, in, in the reality. Rabbi Akiva also doesn't mean they said yes, we will do. We will not do. We will, yes, we will not do what you're telling us not to do. So what's the substance of the argument? Semantics? Explains the Rebbe in a powerful sikh in Chelik Vov in Yisrael. He says, no, Rabbi Akiva came from Gedim. He was like a Baal Tshuva. He, till 40 he never learned Tehra. So he saw, even in the negative, he saw the yes. Rabbi Shmuel was a Kayin Gadl. He grew up in a very pure, it's like a tzaddik. Yes, yes, no, no. It's only someone that saw the light within the darkness that sees the yes in the no. Now, this doesn't mean, God forbid, that you can do the you're transgressing. It just means seeing the positive, not just a yes and no. So based on that, you can further explain why it's stated in this way. And there's more explanations as well, including one more, I'll say, that when you think of it, that it's only God's will, so what's the difference if God says yes or God says no? Both are God's will, both are a yes. It's just in the form of expression, this you're not supposed to do. But both are God's will, positive will. Don't do this and do this. Or if you focus on the actual command, a yes is a yes and a no is a no. So just additional discussion around this uh, question. Next question. In Parsha Mishpatim, let's see where we are here. Yeah. It's taught in Kabbalah, Rabbeinu B'chai Zayar Parsha Mishpatim 125a, a reason for not eating milk and meat together is that meat represents gvura and milk represents chesed. Milk, so gvura and chesed are two attributes, opposite attributes, severity and, or you could say, uh, severity and, um, and kindness. 
or you could also say restraint and giving, the different ways to translate it. And, the, and those two opposing characteristics shouldn't be mixed. But in Seder Shtalsus, we are taught mixing Chesed and Gvura. In the cosmic order, we see mixing Chesed and Gvura makes the Ferris. Makes it even more powerful for us. The Ferris' beauty is the third path, Yaakov, that combines kindness and discipline, which is a beautiful balance between these two. So how do we reconcile this? So the Rebbe has discussed this a number of times, actually in, the fa- in his father's notes on the Zayhar, and explained, and a question goes even more so. You're not allowed to mix wool and linen. Shotness. And yet, in the, bar- bar- the garments of the, k- the Kayan, you see they did wear it. And the answer is like this, the mix of these two, if it's in a pure, holy environment, the Teda tells us there are ways that you could mix them. But if it's not in a holy environment, it could end up being very destructive. So it's a matter of what conditions and what environment. So some things, when you mix them, they actually create something greater. But when, it's, when there's enough bittel, but when there's no bittel, when there's no humility, and there's no sense of higher purpose, it's all about yourself, then mixing two things can actually create something volatile and lethal. That's the brief answer. The Sikha is printed, I believe, in Kiseitze. He talks about Shatnas and Klaim. And, and what volume of the Sikhas? I'm not positive. I'm trying to remember now. Chav Dalet, Chav Tes. One of the volumes, probably 24 or 29, if I recall correctly. It could be 34. Um, I'm sorry I didn't look it up, but I will look it up and I'll give you that footnote where the Rebbe discusses it further. In that spirit, another question came in. Hello, Rabbi. We live in a home in the forest upstate. We cannot dispose our trash the same way it's normally done in the city. Because if we put food, food trash in the garbage can, it causes bears and other animals to come onto the property and make a big mess. So we keep a container in the freezer for food garbage. And when it's full, we take it to the town, to the town refuse, or refuse, refuse field for disposal. I always mix meat and milk trash in this container and thought it's not a problem because nobody would eat it. But something I learned in Pasha Mishpatim may, may change my mind. There's a teaching that not only can we not eat milk and meat, we're also not allowed to benefit from its mixture. I definitely benefit from this mixture of trash as it prevents bears from vandalizing and damaging my property. So this is something I should not, so is this something I should stop doing in order to obey the spirit of the rule? So though this is a borderline or maybe an actual halacha question, I will comment on it. And it's always good to check with an actual rabbi. Though I'm a rabbi, but I'm not a poisik, one who rules. I will say this. Benefiting does not mean throwing it in the garbage. Benefiting means if you go mix it and sell it in a store as a product. So even though you don't eat it, but you're making profit on it. I don't think putting it in a garbage can, mixing milk and meat, because we do this all the time. People put into one garbage can a milk container, they could put a meat uh, product or meat leftover or something. So I'm, uh, I would be pretty confident to say that it's not going the category of benefit as in the benefit, as in a profit, like a business that you're making out of it or some other way that, that you're, you're, you're profiting from it or benefiting in another way, not throwing it out in the garbage, which actually is not a benefit, it's discarding it. Now, if somebody came and wanted to buy your garbage can and say, I could use these products, that would have to be asked by a rov as well, if that would be allowed. Okay. Here's a follow-up to Bashalah, but it also leads me into the follow-up about the recent abuse scandal, which is not only recent, unfortunately, I wish it was over. Hey, what should I tell you? But let me say this. Bishalach follow Shalom, Rabbi Jacobson. Timely question, and maybe relevant to what you've been speaking about lately. We teach openly about private parts and that no one is allowed to touch them there or anywhere if they don't. Or anywhere. Talking about how we, our children. They also know, children, also know that we don't look at private parts of others. My child who was four asked me why he learned in school that men could not hear the women singing on the tambourines. If they're just singing and they're not looking at their private parts, what's the problem? How do you explain this concept to a child that males cannot listen to a woman singing? Thanks. Well, first of all, 
What is the reason you can't hear a woman sing? Because in a way it is a private thing. The Gemara says, Kael bi isha erva. The voice of a woman has a particular intimate nature to it, more than a man. So even though her mouth doesn't have to be covered, but her voice comes from a very deep inner place. It's exactly the same idea. I would even say it even helps the discussion because it takes it away from purely talking about a sexual organ. It's about a demeanor. It's not just a demeanor. It's about, in general, intimacy belongs in the Holy of Holies. Not because we're ashamed of it, and not because it's ugly, and not because we're covering it up and hiding it. Not because it's a secret, because it's private. It's intimate. The heart lies inside your chest for a reason. Because it's a very subtle force. The brain is inside a brain. Why is it protected? Why can't the brain just be like your fingers? Because the most intimate parts of ourselves are always protected. First of all, from contamination, from toxins, from bacteria, and also psychologically. We appreciate it that way. The most intimate part of a human being is the ability to give birth and be like God and bring a new life into this world. The holy of holies. Not ugly, not ashamed, not guilt. Holiness, sanctity. And the same thing is with a woman's voice. And woman's hair for that matter. Covering hair. You have to explain why. So on the contrary, this is a good opportunity to teach children that way, which leads me as a segue into, I, I really honestly would prefer not to continue discussing this topic, but the topic is alive, unfortunately, in many places. Just the recent events just brought it back to the surface for many, but it continues. I just see it from the, I, I keep getting, I have now, I'm not exaggerating, I mean, I've probably received over 1,500 um, one way or other, messages, voice messages, emails, the questions to this forum, maybe even more, if they look at all the different platforms. So I tried to bunching them together into similar topics. This is in addition to all the personal questions that people call me privately to talk about. So I feel I should continue because some of the questions are very important to address, like we just addressed right now. So I'll do a few more and I'll just continue doing as we go along. Maybe until it's eradicated. How about that? That would be good. That it got eradicated, I meant. So let's continue. And I'm not focusing on the events that happened last month, the suicide and the author and so on. I'm focusing now what's relevant to us and our growth. So with that, let me read a few more. Again, I don't think I can cover them all. No way. I listened to the YouTube program. Um, no, I'm reading the wrong one. Here we are. Thanks for discussing this critical topic. We as a Jewish community messed up. The person writes here a stronger word, which I'm not going to read. Different abusers, including the one we're talking about, got what they wanted, to be famous. He should have been ignored like dog poop on the sidewalk. But there's absolutely no leadership. The only reason he was successful for so long is due to the fact when someone complained about him to a rabbi, the, ra the person was told by the rabbis, it can't be true, I'll talk to him, forget about it, he won't do it again, it's bad for your family, if you go to the police, to Torah does not allow us going to the police, your husband will be fired from his job if you press charges, and a, mil and a million other excuses. The biggest issue that needs to be addressed is the cover-up by rabbis, board members of yeshivas and shuls and public figures. When someone calls a leader who is abused, addicted, this only cautions his actions. Oh, he's addicted. That's another excuse. When someone complains about molestation and sexual abuse, the first question the rabbi asks, how do you know your child is telling the truth? That's unacceptable. It is a responsibility and necessity for every victim to come forward and name publicly every rabbi who is informed about an abuser and continue to cover it up. The current revelations of abuse in our communities remind me of... The, oh, that's it. That covers that one question, or I don't say question or comment, and I appreciate it, and I, and I second it by all means. Okay. <clears throat> Another person writes, The current revelations 
of abuse in our communities remind me of the abuse I suffered from a member of my family as a little girl. I'm a Balash Tshuva <coughs> and didn't come from a firm family. I'm not saying this is easy. My perpetrator threatened me that if I told anyone, I would go blind. Chaz Shalom. Being so little, I believed him and didn't ask for help and suffered in silence for many years. But I want to suggest that instead of focusing on all efforts on how to help people recover from abuse, can you develop a way for yeshivas and other schools to educate children to speak up when someone touches them inappropriately? Even to teach children that no one except a doctor or nurse is allowed to touch them under their clothing or some similar teaching. And if someone, even a member of their family, tells them not to talk about how they are being touched, they are still allowed to and must talk about it. That it's not okay if someone threatens them that something bad will happen if they talk about it. Also, flight or flight, fight or flight are not the only responses a person can have to abuse. A third response has been identified, freeze. I myself, I myself still suffer from this freeze response. As I sometimes become mute when someone treats me in a demeaning manner and reminds me of the abuse. Please ask why you Wurzweiler School of Social Work professor Lisa Rosenblatt about the flight response. She is a firm therapist who treats many people in the Jewish communities. Perhaps you can interview her about how to teach children to speak up when they are being abused instead of having to recover from it later. Thank you. Okay. Speaks for itself. And again, I just second that. I have a question, Rabbi Jacobson. I recently heard that sometimes it is correct to give a child a phone, etc., even though it will expose them and give them access to unseemly things on the internet. The explanation was that just like we give our children medications made of dangerous chemicals for the purpose of healing, so too it is justified to hand a device to a child who needs healing. It is not invoked to question today's warriors who valiantly battle for the well-being of our children, but I wonder whether the Rebbe would really agree with this position. The only time, to my knowledge, that we find this in the, in the reverse, Hilitu of Lerosha V'yamus. In other words, on the contrary, to actually cause someone who doesn't deserve a punishment. I don't know if you will be able to address this, but I do plan to listening to this as this Pasha has been quite disconcerting for me, as it has been for many. But maybe sometime in the future. Thank you for your inside guidance and clear voice of conscience, morality, and bringing the Rebbe's message to far and wide. Well, I tend to agree with you. I think just because we give medication, that doesn't mean you have to give your child everything. Medication we give because there's no choice. It's not because we want to give medication. Because the, the child may need it for a certain thing. To make a choice to give a phone and, and, uh, and can lead to all kinds of risky things, I think it's case by case. I'm not going to say absolutely not because the child may get the phone anyway. You have to know the circumstances or the age of the child. But I wouldn't cl- compare it completely to medication. I would say it more based on the circumstances. But you need to have some element. Like let's say you gave your child medication and the child starts taking a lot of medication, more than they should. There's always that risk, but you have to watch. Same thing, if you're going to give a child a phone, even if you find justification, it has to be with some type of control. And you can make conditions. Children understand conditions, just like when you take medication. You don't just get addicted to medication. That's the approach I would respond, uh, the approach I would take. One more question. I am wondering if we need to address the way the Torah is taught. We learn that tzaddikim are on another level and even the most abhorrent things are righteous that we couldn't possibly understand. For example, King David and rape, Yehuda and Tamar, Dina being treated as a prostitute, Torah text, or that the Torah explicitly states that if a woman cries out that she's been violated, she's not to be believed if there's no witnesses. Or clearly a woman cannot be violated in a city because she would be protected. Who would come forward having these messages instilled from such an early age? Thank you for addressing these topics when so few are. Well, 
Let me just say this. All the references in the Torah, to this, the references you just made or others, there's no way the Torah is suddenly justifying, God forbid, or in any way condoning or minimizing crimes and violations. I mean, the story of Dina tells you, look at how brothers reacted. So there's issues of how they reacted, but nevertheless, there's strong reactions. So it's not something we poo-poo. The fact that some people have interpreted the wrong way, or it was, or was misinterpreted for whatever reason, so today, maybe exactly because of the crisis that we're dealing with, causes us, I agree, to go back to these verses and learn them properly, and teach them properly, and not in any way let them feed any type of myth or distortion that would allow anyone to think, oh, everybody has been doing it forever. Unfortunately, it's something I hear. <clears throat> people will acknowledge it's terrible, but people have always been doing it, which right away gives it a certain, not justification, but like, ah, you know, others do it too. We have to have a zero tolerance, and the Torah expects that. And if a person transgresses, it's a transgression. It's not another thing. It's just not business as usual. A crime is a crime. As soon as a crime becomes something banal, like, you know, okay, others do it, that already is also part of the crime. So yes, indeed, we have to go back to these verses and make sure that they're taught properly and never in any way that justifies or condones in any even most, in any even gives a, 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 a inkling of a havamina that something is allowed, God forbid. Okay. So we're going to stop here with that. There are many more. Oh boy. I look at it. Okay. So I want to conclude now on a happy note. I'll just conclude with a chassidist question. And it goes like this. I watched a recent lecture you gave at the Kail Heira on the topic of Tzimtzum and the differences between the Arizal and the Ramak. Let me just say this. Every Thursday, another program which recently began, I do an hour, uh, four, uh, let's say 50-minute class at, at 8.30 a.m. and it's live broadcast. You can find it at um, koelel.nyc, K-O-L-E-L.nyc. I believe we're also posting it on our site, but there for sure you can see it. And I've been going through the whole Seder Shtalshlis, the whole Cosmic Order. I started from Erein Sof, Atzmus and Erein Sof before the Tzimtzum, then the Tzimtzum, Tzimtzum Kipshute, and then the Kav, the Rishimu, the Kav, Odom Kadmin, Akudim, now in the middle of Nekudim and Shvira Sakelim. I'm going through the whole thing. It's a very interesting series and definitely welcome. So this person is referring to that. As I understood the issue here is whether we can reach Atzmus or not. Correct. According to the Ramak, Ramesha Karaviro, we can only reach God as expressed after the Tzimtzum. Well, after the Tzimtzum, the Darizah was Machadish. Meaning God, not the essence of God, but God is in some form of manifestation. But beyond that is not relatable. The novelty of the Ariza is that we can reach Atzmus itself, and the Alter Rebbe took this and made it in the central point of Chabad Chassidus. Is that, if that is correct, then here's my, here's my question. According to the, this understanding, that there is a limit how personal we can relate to God, and we cannot reach Atzmus, then moving on to the final purpose of creation, the era of Mashiach, we also can't reach there and bring Mashiach closer because that is God's realm, so to speak, and we have no access there. Of course we do Torah mitzvahs, but the, but, but the end of the day but depends on God himself. But the end of days depends on God himself. But if we take the other view that we can reach Atmos himself, then perhaps we can reach the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, and influence the coming of Mashiach. Please comment. So I'm not clear what your question is, but let me just say this. The issue is not, I mean, all these were G'dayli Yisrael, great leaders. You know, based on the very, very basic principle, less machshav et no, but no thought can grasp him. And when Moshe asks Hashem, let me see your honor, your glory, your face, God says, no man can see my face and live. So the conclusion of that would be that there's a dimension, and it makes total sense, that we cannot never access. However, God in his, in his, uh, in his chesed, in his kindness, his benevolence, gave us the opportunity through giving us his Torah and his mitzvahs to connect to him so we connect, on, from our terms, we connect to a certain dimension. But maybe in some mysterious way, that also connects to him, but we don't know and we can't relate to that part. The question is, how high can you go? That's what I discussed there. The symptom of that is, teaches us 
the Eina Reich, the Tzim Tzim teaches us that you actually can appreciate even the infinite distance of God, not just the closeness of God. And as such, you can suddenly reach higher levels. And Chassidus Chabad absolutely takes it to the highest as possible. Now obviously God always remains Atzmos, and you still cannot see me and live. The question is, can you experience me and live? And what does live mean? So this is a longer discussion of Chassidus. And ultimately, yes, the final conclusion is that we can reach the highest levels, but always we, it's always a partnership with God. Never, we can't do anything alone, but God infused us with the abilities to reach the highest levels of Eir, and even of Helam, and even of Etzem. That's the, the brief of it, which really means nothing is impossible. We talked about it a few weeks ago, Basil Ligani. And even higher than Eir Sof. So through our Aveda, through our Bittl, through our devotion and dedication to something greater than us, we can become an extension of that which is greater than us. But the condition is you need to be sublimated to that. You can't remain in your ego and live an egocentric life and expect to have that as well. So it's about getting greater by becoming less of your, of, of your so-called, your self-defined identity and experiencing your divine identity. And that leads you to these highest of levels. So with that, we shall conclude. Everyone have a very good week and a blessed week. This is Chassidus Applied, My Life Chassidus Applied, every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. And I look forward to speak further with you. And please share your thoughts and comments and questions at chassidusapplied.com. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com donate.